what, our third one that we've done. And, you know, for everybody here who has some familiarity with the Occupy movement, we really feel it's essential to have some understanding, a basic understanding of economy, past, present, and then to kind of come together and examine and explore potential future economies. So we hope that tonight's uh, presentation will inspire that. And we may have people wandering in. I'm thinking we have pretty stiff competition with the weather tonight. Um, but you know, to your advantage, we can take plenty of time to have discussion. And uh, and you're in for a treat tonight. And also, Herb, you brought some books, right? That you right. wanted to perhaps pass around. Uh, yeah. Oh, well, that that take attention away from speakers. <laughs> And maybe we could do that at the end, because the, the way we're going to flow today is each speaker is going to have roughly 20 to 30 minutes, whatever you need, to present on your topic. And then at the end, we'll have discussion and questions, and maybe at that time we can pass resources around. I also want to mention that um, there's an Occupy Buffalo email list. So if you're not receiving regular correspondence from us, please sign up. And also, just on, the, on behalf of Occupy Buffalo and the School of Everything, I really want to welcome everybody to tonight's uh, conference. And I'm Linda Abrams. If you have any questions for me about any of our events, I did bring some calendars for people. There's some materials you could take a look at, you know, at the end of the conference. And now I'll turn it over to my Jen. You want to go first? I'll go first. Okay. In the. Uh Spirit of full disclosure, I'm not an economist. In the Department of Management at Mises College, but I dabble in this kind of thing. So uh, I invite you to dabble with me. Your guess is as good as theirs. All right. <laughs> this uh, I, I, this is a PowerPoint, which you're not going to be able to read them, but at least I can I can kind of point to them. You'll look at that instead of me, which is what I want. This is a. Uh, an ad for some industrial property for sale on Walton Avenue at the corner of Dick Road, and uh, and it's let's see, it's got 130,000 square feet, and it's zoned uh, for light industrial, and it was built in 1990, and it's selling for five and a half million dollars, which is not a bad price. It's completely vacant. The it's not selling. They're asking. Well, that's asking. Okay. That doesn't mean they're going to get it. Uh, well, I'm hoping I get, you know, I'd like to get the commission on that. But, uh, it, it, the 83 men and women who worked there for American Axle were all permanently let go at the end of February. Okay. And the company, where is it? The company is moving the, the work to Mexico and to the Midwest, uh, more specifically Ohio and Indiana. Indiana being the latest right to work state. <coughs> dubious honor. American Axle is not in financial difficulty. It just wants to reduce its costs and increase returns to shareholders. Uh, the company made $162 million in profits in 2011, and that was up from $115 million in profits the year before. But American Axle claimed that it needed the workers at this Chictawaga plant to accept a market competitive labor agreement what a market competitive labor agreement is. Uh, something they refused to do. They voted in unanimously, almost unanimously voted it down. So a UAW spokesperson said the workers' refusal was, quote, an indication that hardworking people are sick of constantly helping companies through concessions and back to profitability and companies refusing to share in that. Okay, so that's, that's what happened earlier this this year in Chicktawaga. You know, but wait a minute, wait a minute. Isn't that what corporations are supposed to do? And in, in the current economic environment, that's what they're supposed to do, right? This is an economic environment that's characterized, characterized by a, an ideology called neoliberalism. Yeah. Yes. In 2000, General Motors, which is one of the biggest corporations in the world, in 2000, they paid no corporate income taxes at all. And how they do that was this, this executive gets a $10 million bonus 
plus his $25 million salary and so on and so forth. So all the big you know, deals won't be over branch, on the act branch, but all of the get these inflated salaries. They pay income taxes on that, of course, but that's nowhere near the taxes that would be corporate taxes. Well, they show a loss on their books. So. But that's that's the way they're supposed to behave, I would contend. And and under what we call neoliberalism. Now, you're seeing this term more and more in the United States, but for a while, nobody knew what this meant. Uh, the campesinos and agricultural cooperatives in El Salvador knew what it meant. I talked to them about it, but we didn't use that term in the United States until recently. We said things like market fundamentalism or the Washington Consensus or uh, the labor economist at Harvard Freeman said, called it laissez-faire economic, the laissez-faire economic experiment, um, unbridled free market. There's a guy down at, at Penn State who calls it economic liberalism. Okay, all kinds of terms meaning the same thing, essentially. Neoliberalism. So, um, you know, it's, it's unbridled free market opposition to state intervention in the economy with, of course, some major and somewhat hypocritical exceptions. Um, that's Glenn Beck. That's Milton Friedman. And that's Frederick Hayek. And neoliberalism became a movement in economics in 1947. Uh, Frederick Hayek, who was from the Austrian School of Economics, uh, convened a meeting of like-minded individuals in Switzerland at a place called Mont Pelerin. I think I'm pronouncing that correct. And formed what they call the Mont, Peler Mont Pelerin Society, which is still in existence. And it's made up of economists and political scientists and fellow travelers developed uh, and to an extensive degree this thing called neoliberalism. Well, Glenn Beck uh, in the summer of 2010 said that everybody should read Hayek's book called The Road to Certain and it jumped to the number one seller in Amazon, oh, just like that. And uh, That's scary that Glenn uh, Beck has that kind yeah. of power. <laughs> well, a lot of people <laughs> used it as a, as a uh, sleep aid, but... Uh, <laughs> But it, nonetheless, it, it was, became quite popular. And in that book, one of the things Hayek suggests is that the economy is so complex that governments really can't do anything about it. So that evidently that appealed to Glenn Beck. Um, and their ideas, the ideas of the neoliberal, what, what uh, Philip Morosky at Notre Dame, who edited this book, what, what he calls the neoliberal thought collective, those ideas caught fire in 1980s, late 70s, early 80s, and 1980 is like a watershed year. If you look at all the charts, everything changes in 1980. So that's when Reagan and Thatcher, and Deng Xiaoping, and Pinochet you know, in Chile came to power. You know, the Chilean coup, the um, coup that toppled Salvador Allende, in the early phases of Pinochet's you know, government, he was relying heavily on. University of Chicago economists, who, uh, including Friedman, who were involved in this. Mm -hmm. Who's the fourth one right now? Uh, this one or this one? That's Deng Xiaoping. Oh, Deng Xiaoping. Yeah. Who has his own version of China, has its own version of So, over the next two decades, neoliberal, three decades, neoliberal practices would be extended forcefully into the developing regions of the world. Um, Gordon Laffer, who's a uh, economist at, at the University of Oregon makes a convincing case that the Iraq invasion was motivated by a desire to extend neoliberal reforms to the heart of the oil rich Middle East. And the Bush administration, remember the Bush administration, there was a lot of talk about democracy, spreading democracy. Well, if you if you kind of look at what he was talking about, he conflated, or the administration conflated political freedom with economic, quote, freedom. And that included the values of the free market constituting fundamental moral principles right up there with the right to vote. So it was a, this, this neoliberal uh, regime got off with a bang with 
Reagan and, continu and continues on today. And it's not just a Republican phenomenon. Clinton was a died in the world neoliberal. Obama is a neoliberal. Obama this week was in Colombia signing a trade accord with free the, trade. Colombia yeah, trade. With, the, with Colombia. Okay, so and Obama brought all the the gang back into the White House. The ones who brought us the disaster. Teddy Kennedy brought him. Pardon? Teddy Kennedy brought Obama. Yeah. So anyway, that's a little history. The uh, look how scary it is. Some features of uh, neoliberalism. First of all, it was a it was adopted and promoted by neoliberal true believers in international financial institutions like the WTO, IMF, Inter-American Development Bank, Asian Development Bank, and so on. And obviously, countries like the U.S., Japan, European Union, what I mentioned from Morosky, Morosky calls the neoliberal thought collective. Well, I'm just going to go quickly through some features of neoliberalism. And you can't read that, but uh, if you can, you're really great. Um, <laughs> these are called structural adjustment programs, or SAPs, in developing countries. These were requirements that the international financial institutions placed on debtor nations in order to get the money, so to speak. But they're also features of neoliberalism in developed parts of the world as well. Most of my examples are here. It's scary. Um, first one is, and probably it's the most important, is deregulate the economy within and across borders. Deregulate financial transactions. Remove barriers to the free flow of capital. Allow free speculation in stocks, bonds, currency, portfolio investment. So, you know, it used to be there were constraints on placed on investors, foreign and domestic, in many of these countries, whereby if you if you withdrew a certain amount of money, you had to wait for maybe a week or 10 days or two weeks for it to clear before you could take it and take it out of the country, that type of thing. Uh, or you, there would be a cap on how much you could withdraw or take out of an international investment you know, monetary account of some sort per day. And that just slowed down. That helped to mitigate the, the consequences of a rush on the bank by international investors. So when those kinds of constraints were removed and were, the countries were required to remove them, you had things like the peso crisis in Mexico in 1994, and you had the disaster in Argentina in 2001, 2002. And uh, you know, in Argentina overnight, over half the population became poor. I mean, mm -hmm. technically below the poverty line. So, um, also deregulate uh, and remove barriers to foreign direct investment and ownership. It used to be if you wanted to uh, buy a company in Mexico, you'd have to have 51% Mexican national ownership. Now, thanks to neoliberalism, you could buy the company and have 100% ownership. You can extract profits and, and transport them to your offshore account in the Cayman Islands. And remove barriers to imports, things like tariffs, quotas, uh, subsidies. You know, in other words, liberate um, the, the market. And, and in ways that you yourself as the colonized, the economically colonizing country does not demand of its own self. Well, only only the, the small countries, the four countries are required well, we have a very regulated. We should. We don't have. Regulated. We have. It's more regulated than the economies in the four so-called recipient countries that are really being colonized. We got. We've got to subsidize. Things. We've got to subsidize the sugar beet industry, right? Oil. We we, we've yes. got to subsidize the wheat, the rice farmers. Me? That's right. We've got to do that. We've got to subsidize the dairy producers so that's they can sell powdered milk in Jamaica below market price. in our own economy <laughs> that if it's Angola, yeah. 
Yeah, but we're they don't want the Angolan government involved in propping up their own companies. But we're us and they're them. That's what I'm saying. Oh, okay. Yeah, anyway, there are a lot of things that we're supposed to do under neoliberalism that we don't do. But, what job would you do? Well, I'll show you. Just oh, okay. Something. Something. The big one. <clears throat> so, anyway, Morosky makes clear that deregulation, in many instances, cashes out as re-regulation. It's just a different type of regulation. And he talks about uh, uh, new forms of techno-managerial governance to protect the ideal market. Right? So it may not look like regulation, but there are um, you know, government, government programs and policies in place that will protect the, the market. And neoliberalism emphasizes market friendliness. That, all, that countries need to be you know, friendly to the market. Um, and what does that mean? Who are we actually being friendly to? We're being friendly to the international investment finance types. And those are the people that brought us the bubbles, the, the SNL crisis in the 1980s after we deregulated the savings and loan industry, the dot com boom and bust, Japan's lost decade. The Asian meltdown. Oh, the these but goodies. Yeah, the housing <laughs> bubble, <laughs> subprime crisis of 2007 and, eight, and the recession, and the bank too big to fail bailouts. Okay, so market friendliness. Let's be friendly. Okay. Um, all right, that's number one. That's probably the most important one. Number two is decentralize and privatize public agencies and assets, utilities, transportation, healthcare, education. Here we go. Um, uh, the, neoliberal, the neoliberal notion is that everything is fair game for marketization. Yeah, I, I, I refer to this book a lot because this is a book of scholarly readings. It's published, or, or articles published by Harvard University Press. So these are not ideologues, they're scholars. And I'm, I'm just amazed at some of the things they say. Anyway. Uh, telecommunication systems in El Salvador, or all over Latin America. You know who um, Carlos Slim is? Yes, we do. Well, it depends on what day of the week it is. Sometimes he's number two. The Mexico uh, telecommunications giant. He owns track phone. That's what That's I right. hmm. That's right. He owns all kinds of things. He's one of the richest men in the world, absolutely. Had. Over $100 billion in personal. And most of his. I mean, he had got his start uh, as a shrewd investor, but then um, I think it was Carlos Salinas privatized the telecommunication industry in Mexico. Well, Carlos was his friend, and so he got the concession, and he also got wireless with it. So he runs wireless all over Latin America, uh, many of the wireless. So that, 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 that helped Carlos. Uh, in El Salvador, uh, the government, I know El Salvador because I've lived there, I've been there many times. The government attempted to uh, privatize the water system. El Salvador is a little country about the size of Massachusetts, six million people, had a nationalized water system. The government tried to privatize it. In El Salvador, when people don't like things, they burn tires in the road. Occupy Buffalo, you have to try that. Elmwood, yeah, yeah, burn tires in the road. It really disrupts things. People don't like that. Um, and so the government pulled back, and instead what they did was they decentralized. So they probably, they uh, passed legislation saying that now, okay, Sanana, you're responsible for what, the water system for your metropolitan area, San Miguel, San Salvador, Vesulipan, uh, and all these towns, called Libertad. Now they had to do it themselves. They tap into the national distribution system, but they have to provide all the services for the local customer. Well, that's good, except they don't have any expertise. And of course, the federal government didn't give them any money. So it was like an unfunded mandate that we have here in the United States. So what did they do? The government let them issue concessions to private operators. And so in, a, in essence, they privatized the They farmed it out. They farmed it out. And, um, Speaking of water, this you can't see, but this is a, a label for a company called Veolia. But you know what the what this company is? 
largest uh, holder of water rights on earth. Well, and Veolia was given a contract to operate the city of Buffalo water supply in 2010. It's a 10 year contract. So that's who's operating your water supply. It's, okay. And Veolia is a French firm. It runs water systems for 600 communities in the United States. It's in 66 countries and it employs 300,000 people. And they run the city waters. They got a 10 year contract. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Uh, we see Buffalo Water. They're not employees of them, right? Buffalo Water Department. The Buffalo Water Department exists and works kind of side by side. This is with them. This is like the, the management, the management firm. Do they pay money to the city, or the city does it for them? They pay money to this. They got the contract. No, I understand. So but I, but I see Buffalo Water guys, you know, yeah. city trucks. So yeah. the city's paying. That's right. The right. city is, pays. Is this Alfred paying the city, or no? They're getting the. Uh, they're getting the work done for nothing. We're paying. We're That's right. For it. We're That's right. To the sidebar, yeah. Buffalo's water rates are higher than Phoenix, Arizona. That's right. And we have more abundant water here than Phoenix ever had. Our water is better, too. That's what we need for, right? Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, just I have, there are thousands of examples of privatization around the world. Airports privatized. Uh, in the United States, under Bush, all federal agencies were required to put jobs out for bid to determine whether government or private firms would do the work. All government under under Bush. Okay. Um, a recent study found that for 33 of 35 occupations that were looked at, the government pays billions more to hire private sector contractors than it would to have the work done by government employees in house. Now, Obama, the Obama administration rescinded that. It must have been an executive order that required all federal agencies to do this. But you know, next year we may be back to that. Again. Another sidebar to that. Uh, a lot of fed corporations that are contracted by the federal government subcontract to places like India, and that was what was going on at NOAA and at the MMS and the first one. So they literally, what you're doing is exporting government jobs out of the country. Well, that's I know that's, that's what we should be doing. <laughs> okay, uh, you might remember that X exec. Chris Collins turned the WIC program in Erie County over to Catholic Charities. He, and here's a quote when he did it, he said, I have decided it is more efficient and cost effective for the taxpayers for the county to simply transfer the administration of some of these services into the private sector. So it's every level of government all over the world is doing this. You know, things like the Westminster Foundation, that uh, received a half million dollar grant to plan the Buffalo Promise neighborhood up behind Bennett High School. Um, M&T Bank is a major player along with the Westminster Community Charter School. So there's all this kind of you know, privatization going on here in Buffalo, in the United States, in Mexico, in El Salvador, Philippines. You know. a, a great example of what's going on right now is Greece and Spain. Greece now who just accepted the IMF bailout, right? They are, they, they are, this is a classic example, because we often think, I, I think your example earlier was that this happens, it's, it's, it's the first world doing this to the third world, and that has by and large been what it is, but it's happening quietly here in the first world, we're just not paying attention, and I think Greece is a perfect example where you can see that happening, one of the first uh, structural adjustments, SAPs, that they, they forced Greece to agree upon just a month ago was cutting back 20% of, of the government workers' jobs, just slashing 20%. I view that as the yeah. European Central Bank is colonizing the United States. Yeah. 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 But this is how you colonize, the same in your individual life. When you owe somebody money, you, that person owns you. So Greece is now going to owe that European Central Bank. Frankfurt will own Greece. Yeah, and, and and it's the way colonization has been done all over the rest of the world. Now they're going to the little edge countries in the EU itself. My, my say, contention is that, you know, uh, you'll see, I mean, you'll respond to what's going on in Greece with that kind of a, a, you know, a cognitive model. Mm -hmm. This is a kind of economic colonization. Uh, other people will become distressed when jobs get sent overseas. 
And, and so they think about this in terms of some kind of a justice issue where, where, where jobs are being, people are being displaced, the middle class is being attacked, and so on and so forth. My contention is all of these things stem from a consistent, coherent ideology that people who are close to or if not the decision makers adhere to. These guys call it um, a conspiracy. So you believe what you like, but I, I think there's enough evidence that this is, it's not, it's not just, you know, the, the yeah. European Union, the Eurozone colonizing Greece or Portugal or Spain. It's part of the whole international picture. You know, it's another thing, the per capita debt in this country is just as high as in Greece. Because we're not tied to the, to the uh, euro. euro, so we just print our, print our, print our, print our way. We're not supposed to do that. No, but, we're not supposed. But to. we do. Yeah. We can because of the arm. Because Obama doesn't mention it. He's been slowly devaluating the dollar, which of course is going to cost the price of gas to go up if you have to buy it. Well, 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 another thing about it's unique about Greece is the first time sovereign debt has been turned into private debt. That's right. So in the past, what countries would do is well, find the Weimar solution. Is that well, there we're privatizing debt now, you know, oh, privatize everything. Anyway, I'm just going to run through these. Reduce public spending on social programs, employment, education, health care. Um, you know, the 1966 welfare, welfare law reform in the United States under the Clinton administration led to deep, deep cuts in basic programs for low income children, families elderly, disabled, fundamental structure change in aid for dependent children. Uh, the New York State law capping local school property tax increases to 2%. You know, New York doesn't look so bad compared to other parts of the country, but that's, that's moving in the direction. Uh, calls for cuts in benefits for Medicaid recipients. I mean, all, over and over and over again, there is this, this uh, reduction in public spending on social programs. Um, Here's one of the places where we don't do so well. Neoliberalism calls for a balanced budget and maintaining stable balance of payments, okay? So this is my picture of our president laughing. And, and why is this man laughing? Because in 2011, our national debt was $15 trillion and we had a $125 billion trade deficit. So we're not very good neoliberals when it comes to balancing the budget or the, the uh, balance of payments. But Ronald Reagan said big deficit don't have a deficit. You won't worry about it. Um, except when it's in somebody else's backyard. Yes. Okay. Because, for instance, in Latin America, under this neoliberal, you know, the structural adjustment programs that required them to rein in public spending, to, um, to flatten uh, inflation and so on. Many of these countries now actually do have, you know, their current account balance is, is positive. They're in the black. And they're now becoming popular investment targets. And that's something that they ought to worry about. And of course, the, the question is at what cost? Hey. Like Brazil? Brazil, Perfect. Uh, Peru, Argentina, Argentina, Chile, and even. You know, even El Salvador uh, has good infrastructure. It's, it's an investment target. Number five is reduce taxes on the wealthy. Who was for? What was for? Balance the budget. That's the one we don't do so well. Uh, so reduce taxes on the wealthy. Uh, you remember trickle down? I saw I saw trickle down in the in the paper just. In the last two days, somebody mentioned trickle down. So trickle down is still with us. Oh, I know who it was. It was whoever the whoever the, uh, the house no the house majority leader. Boehner. Yeah. No, not Boehner. Oh, the other guy. No, Cantor. No, this guy who sponsored the house uh, tax bill where they want to oh, get. Oh, Ryan. 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 Oh, Ryan. No, no. This Eric is, Cantor is the other guy. I don't think. But it doesn't matter. They're all it, they're all interchangeable. But. But this is the one, it passed again today. It's the, 
that they're going to give a 20% tax break to businesses under, with under 500 employees. Okay. And the Democrats say that's going to cost $46 billion, just like that. So, but, um, but anyway, I mean, you know, and who's going to benefit, obviously? I mean, owner, those, there's a lot of businesses that have between 100 and 500 employees. And many of them are doing just fine, thank you. Um, as late as 1981, the top marginal tax rate in the U.S. was 70%. Uh, 19 and after you know after that it went down by 80 89 it was 28 percent now it's at 35 percent and has been since nine, since 2003 and um, you know how rich you have to be to pay the top rate top marginal rate of 35 percent no well, you, you just have to have three, you just have to have three hundred seventy four thousand dollars in taxable income and be married and file a check. That's of course that's your that's your taxable income. That's after you've taken all your tax breaks. Well, last Monday you probably remember the Senate voted on a bill that would have you know have taken a step towards creating a fair quote fairer tax system. This was uh, Senate Bill twenty two thirty, which would have implemented the Buffett rule which meant that, uh, that millionaires and billionaires should not have lower effective tax rates than working families, and it would have imposed um, uh, at least a 30% minimum federal effective tax rate on people who made a million dollars or more. Okay. Uh, it passed 51 to 45, but of course, in this day and age, that means nothing. That means it's dead, and uh, it was almost entirely on party lines. For, for 2010 and 2011, Mitt Romney claimed $47 million in income to him and his wife, and he paid an effective tax rate of somewhere between 14 and 15 percent. Yeah. Well, that's good. Uh, um, for him? Yeah. I well, wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. Uh, the um, the neoliberals, this is a quote, claim that pronounced inequality of economic resources is a, quote, necessary functional characteristic of their ideal market system. Please say that again. Yeah, okay. that it's a necessary well. functional characteristic of their ideal market system. It is, quote, a strong motor force for progress and, quote, the rich are a boon to humankind, and people should be encouraged to envy and emulate them. So what's your problem, people? <laughs> Come on. Analysis. Get with the... We're not working hard enough. That's right. Is there a person who said that? Huh? Is there a person that, who said that? That's this guy from Morosky and his... his uh, I spell Morosky. M-I-R-O-W-S-K-I. M-I-R-O-W-S-K-I. Yes. W S K I. Oh, he's a uh, he's a political scientist and economist at Notre Dame. And his the other guy who's who edited this book is called Dieter Play. I don't know how to pronounce it. Playway. He's a German. He's in Berlin. Um, okay. What else? Uh, liberalized labor markets. I like that term. <laughs> Free the labor market. Yeah, liberalized labor market. <laughs> what does that mean? Well, it means weaken or reduce, union, eliminate union, laws, regulations, protecting workers. It means doing away with job protection, unemployment rights, mandated benefits like workers' comp, pension rights, and collective bargaining. Um, in the United States, of course, union okay, density so. dropped from 24% in 1979, the year before, that became right. 1980, uh, to less than 12% in 2011. In the private sector, it dropped from 21% in 1979 to below 7% this year, this last year. Okay. So it's working. Um, you know, a dirt, the, one of the things that this book points out is that the, the neoliberal, the neoliberals at Mont Pelerin Society, they debated whether or not unions were okay 
within the, the kind of neoliberal regime. And those who felt that they were uh, an impediment to this free market approach to understanding the world economy won out. So there's a definite uh, hostility to organized labor among neoliberals, and including Hayek and Milton Friedman. Okay. So the solution was to weaken uh, protection for workers. Uh, just to go back to the deregulation part, um, uh, okay, let's see if there's anything left here. No, oh, I thought, this is Herman Cain, remember him? Yeah. He dropped out of the, the race for the Republican presidential nomination. You remember he was the, he was the uh, owner or CEO of Godfather's Pizza. And he said, he's talking about the recall election in Wisconsin, or the recall movement in Wisconsin. The recall, yeah, the recall Governor, Governor Walker, who along with the GOP majorities in both houses of the Wisconsin legisl legislature, essentially stripped state workers in Wisconsin of their collective bargaining rights. So they have a recall movement, and they got over a, a million signatures. And Herman Cain says, if the unions win in Wisconsin, that means that they don't want balanced budgets. They still want to continue to destroy the state. And when I ran Godfather's Pizza, my employees had every right to unionize if they wanted to. And then he finishes by saying, now, if they had decided to unionize, I could also fire all of them. So, the right to quit. Herman Cain was a was a good neoliberal. Well, was not a mafia thing? Yeah. Yes. Well, I don't know about <laughs> that. Of course, of course, <laughs> under uh, U.S. labor law, National Labor Relations Act, it's illegal to do what he's talking about. But then our law has no teeth. They didn't just slap you on the hand. So he's right in a way. Number seven, establish corporations as key institutions politically and economically. This is also something that was debated among the neoliberals, but the corporatist corporation, pro corporation people want out. So in the United States, you know, corporations have this status as legal persons. Citizens United just kind of made that very, very clear. And uh, the neoliberals would want that to be kind of axiomatic. The corporations should be afforded the right of individual persons, and they should enjoy the freedom to act self-interestedly in market exchange. That's very important. Okay, some negative consequences of neoliberal, the neoliberal regime increase wealth and earnings gap between the rich and the rest. It's, I know, that's me, I don't know about the rest of, it, of you. Uh, and you've probably seen these figures. Among OECD countries, the U.S. has the fourth highest income inequality, surpassed only by Chile, Mexico, and Turkey, three countries that we don't normally compare ourselves to. Uh, the highest earners, the top 1%, so this is what the 99 percenters are aware of, income more than doubled from 1980 to, 19, to 2009. The rest of us barely stayed even or lost ground. Of income created in the U.S. in 2010, this figure just came out. That was $288 billion of new income created in the U.S. in 2010. 93% of it went to the top 1%. The top 10% of Americans' average income is 15 times higher than that of the bottom 10%. That rose from 10 times higher in the 1980s, and so on and so forth. Most economic growth under the neoliberal regime benefits only 12% of the world's population. The richest 50% in the developed world plus the richest 13% in the developing world. In Latin America, where income inequality is among the highest, the poorest 20% the poorest 20 of the population accounts for only 3% of national consumption. And the corollary is that the income it goes to this incredibly small segment of the population. Could be used uh, in social capital, education, healthcare, housing, and instead, it's, well, I don't know where it goes. And that leads to greater use of market mechanisms to deal with the problems that are 
that are caused by this incredible imbalance of income. And of course, the, the uh, neoliberals, this is a quote, the market can always provide solutions to problems caused by the market. And, uh, you know, so the Bush tax cuts, for instance, are, are responsible for 30% of the current budget deficit. So what happens? You strangle, you strangle infrastructure development, you strangle social capital investment, you strangle the education system. Poverty, in, in, in 49 million people in the U.S. below the poverty line in 2010. In El Salvador, which is typical of Central America, 48% living on less than $2 a day. Uh, bankruptcy of thousands of local producers all over the developing world. Uh, and partly as a result of that increased crime, there's a paradox of neoliberalism, in, in particularly in the developing world. There are huge adjustment costs for these countries that have to implement these neoliberal structural adjustment programs. And that tends to exacerbate conditions conducive to drug trafficking, money laundering, and it undermines the economic and political stability of these countries. So, you know, you have urbanized gangs, people who have been displaced uh, in the agricultural sector, move into the cities, uh, they get involved in the informal economy because it's a, it's a smart thing to do economically. And so they extort money from bus drivers on a daily basis in El Salvador or, you know, some places they kidnap people and so on. Um, the, the crop, crop substitution, that's been a big thing. Either, either the, you know, the coca growers will ally themselves with with groups like FARC in Colombia, because they have no, there's no option, or people who were growing corn, and now that market is cut out from under them because of their now the country now Colombia is going to import subsidized corn from the United States. Well, put that put that land into some productive crop that they can make a profit on, and you know, coca is as good as anything else. And lastly, increase in employment insecurity. Um, large sectors of the population in the developing world is, quote, people whose labor and meager capacity for consumption are not required. So they just become, they fall outside the, the system. And uh, their lives are miserable. Unemployment jumped to 10% during the recession. It continues about 8% in structural unemployment. Um, I'm almost done. Here. You know what these are? These is Rus the Russian doll. And Morosky uses the Russian doll as, um, as an analogy concerning the spread of neoliberalism in the modern world. He says the inner doll, the little doll there, is the Mont Pelerin Society insiders, the ones who were the the peak of this movement, the brain trust. And the next shell, and there's too many shells here, but the next shell is the academic departments where neoliberals came to dominate, like the University of Chicago in the United States, the University of Virginia, the University of Freiburg in Germany. And then the next shell, he says, is the general purpose think tanks that sheltered neoliberals, like the Institute of Economic Affairs. You'll hear these on the news and read about them. American Enterprise Institute, the Heritage Foundation, and the one that I love is the American Legislative Exchange Council, mm -hmm. Al Elling, okay, that's in the news these days. But these groups are able to get very quick position papers out to, out to politicians who are sympathetic. Alec will give them draft legislation that they can enter uh, and put in the hopper. And the think tanks provide talking heads for the media. So that's the third shell. And then the outer shell, according to Morosky, is supposedly local grassroots organizations with, I, this is my term, salted neoliberals that are focused on single issue campaigns. You know, I think a lot of like Tea Party stuff or anti-public sector union groups. 
know, that it looks like it's just people who are fed up with, with public sector unions having benefits that they shouldn't have, but there are probably some people in that movement who are pushing and I guess this, this, is, this is kind of crazy because this is an academic book. Um, so some final thoughts. That's Gordon Gecko. Some people thought that the recession would be the death knell, death knell for neoliberalism. I think that's very unlikely. Nobody went to jail. Nobody has yet gone to jail. The incentives continue to favor risk, exploitation, hubris to the max. You know, the bankers are still paying themselves as big of bonuses as they can. Um, and the bankers use the government cash and guarantees to recapitalize themselves and to pay the largest salaries and bonuses they could manage in the name of retaining talent. In the meantime, they did not make the new loans and they did not help mortgages who were underwater. Um, Morosky talks about the double truth of neoliberal ideology. He said it's it's difficult for outsiders to see the connection, <clears throat> the ideological backstory. We just see these things that are in the headlines. And he said that's because it's very difficult to penetrate beyond the particular Russian doll that your nose is up against. You know, you're just looking at one thing or the other. Um, and so it's this loose coupling makes it difficult to paint the neoliberal thought collective as a conspiracy. Morosky claims neoliberals believe the elite are to be tutored to understand the necessity of repressing democracy, while the masses are lured by, quote, takes of roll, tales of rolling back the nanny state and being set free to choose as consumers. And finally, Hayek himself raised vehement criticisms of majority rule and legislative law and preferred the judiciary as the source of the rule of law. Now, what, is, what does that sound like? Well, well, but it also sounds like Citizens United, okay? Uh, it sounds like the Supreme Court looking at the, uh, you know, the health care bill right now, okay? How about George W. Bush? Well, I'd rather not talk about George W. Bush. <laughs> I mean, the Supreme Court. Oh, yeah? Yeah, you packed oh. it, right? That they made. No. Oh, they got the, oh, the, the thing. whole thing with the George. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, and my last sentence is economic liberals or neoliberals, that's what this guy at Penn State calls the neoliberals, continue to fear that citizenship rights will encroach on property life, property rights. So, that's. We left that one element of the process, which is the rise of the, the security state. State. Yeah, that goes along with the, uh, there's a, a number of very interesting examples of that as well. Puerto Rico. I just want to, you know, keep moving and saying questions to the end so we give a chance for all the panelists to speak and then we're going to have a great discussion, I know. So thank you so much. And I'm sorry for taking so no, much time. Cool. We'll just keep rolling. I want to make you believe in this. Yeah, um, I'm going to be shifting gears up. Uh, but before I do it, I just want to make a comment of neoliberalism. Um, you know, uh, one of the things that I, I look at a lot with, with my work is, is, is racism and intersectionality theory. And, you know, this is Occupy Economics, I know, but let's move over to Occupy Social Science for a section. And what neoliberalism, you know, ultimately is, in effect, is, you know, the economic manifestation of white supremacy. Because when you start breaking it down, um, geographically as to who the consumer nations are and who the producer nations are, where the resources come from, and labor is now a resource, globalized, uh, that you start seeing the people who are supposed to be consuming, people supposed to be enjoying all the privileges that neoliberalism gives to this elite few, you know, the 1% here, you know, all white Europeans. The resources come from lands predominantly dominated, you know, by brown people, black people, you know, red people, um, and when I say resources, I don't just mean uh, energy and, and um, minerals and, you know, I'm also talking about labor, with stripping people's lives of, of their labor. And, uh, you know, the only way you can really even begin to uh, 
embrace this insanity that we need to have exploitation, we need to have poverty, is that you need to have white supremacy. You need to have something other than just an economic equation that allows for this sociopathic thought to be acceptable. And that ideology is, is white supremacy. So you know, I, I would just add that neoliberalism ultimately, as it's practiced, you know, it's a European manifestation. It's imposed, you know, following the old, you know, colonial lines. The areas where we used to capture slaves, the areas where we captured resources, the areas where we enslaved populations and sweatshops, you know, are the areas that are going to be structurally hurt by neoliberalism, the majority of the planet. And the areas that benefit would be, you know, a few white nations, white communities, and then you have internal colonialization. You know, which we feel very much here in Buffalo within those, you know, within those predominantly white nations. And again, that colonization, that colon, you know, that that also follows racial lines, as as we see here in Buffalo and as we see across the United States and Canada. So again, you know, no matter where you look at the neoliberal model in, in play, it can only exist in a society that embraces and tolerates racism. But I actually, um, Karen, when he when he asked me to come wanted me to shift gears, and, and the little talk I'm going to be presenting is one that I haven't really given here in Buffalo before, and it relates back to um, research that I did uh, for, my, for my doctoral dissertation and for the uh, two books that I, I wrote. The most recent one uh, came out last year in 2011, and it's a study of the, the Rainbow family. Uh, I'm not quite sure how many people are really familiar. And, and one thing I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand up and pace just so your heads can move back and forth and you can all stay awake. So it's just kind of a, a little, you know, and not because I'm antsy, but it keeps me awake too. Um, but the, the Rainbow Family is a group of um, nomadic, non hierarchical anarchists that create spontaneous cities of up to 40,000 people deep in the woods, deep in the wilderness areas, deep in national forests around the world. It began in 1972. Uh, it was kind of an outgrowth of the rock festivals in the 1960s. People went to Woodstock, and it turned out that although there was a fantastic lineup on the stage, the attraction was not the stage. The attraction was the crowd, and how the crowd created community, and how when they were cut off from the rest of the world, you know, they improvised, they survived, how they were faced with emergency, and they created a utopia. And people started talking. Wouldn't it be great if we could have large rock festivals without the bands and without the stage? We just kind of get a circle of, of maybe 40,000 people, and we, we entertain each other. We look at each other. And then wouldn't it be great if we could do that without capitalism, without commerce, without this exploitation, without having to buy tickets, without there being promoters who are taking our money and not giving us drinking water? And in 1972, they created a rumor that such a gathering would occur. And it would occur deep in a national forest in Colorado. And people started showing up, and the police started arresting them, and more people showed up, and more people were arrested, and the jails were filled. And then dozens of thousands of people started showing up, and eventually they just opened the road. Uh, I believe the governor's name was Love at the time, right? Ironic. Uh, these things always, always come. And, and you had the first rainbow gathering in 1972. The rainbows have gotten together and have gathered annually ever since then. The rainbow ethos says ignore all rumors of cancellation. So the more any government agency tries to spread the rumor that the gathering has been canceled, everybody will be arrested, <coughs> the more people say, yes, the gathering, the gathering, we're going to the gathering. Uh, in the 1980s, the phenomenon spread around the world. Uh, now most of the rainbow gatherings, the vast majority of rainbow <coughs> gatherings are across Europe, uh, in the Middle East, in, in Latin America, small but more persistent, so it's now a global phenomenon. It exists as, and this is really cutting a cutting 350 page book down to like a, a quick five minute synopsis, so just bear with me, if you lose me, just kind of shout. Uh, but the rainbow gatherings exist because they create they don't liberate space. Unlike most every other revolutionary and utopian movement in history that tries to capture some space and eventually is a sitting target, the rainbows liberate time. They create what uh, anarchist theorist um, Peter Lamborn Wilson, who writes under the name Hockey Bay, uh, refers <coughs> to as a temporary autonomous zone. And this has been a model for the Occupy movement as well. 
you're liberating not so much space, but you're liberating time. So for a moment, you go into the forest, you spread a room where it's going to be, 40,000 people show up, put in the infrastructure for a city, everything is free, everything is shared, it's a communal, it is, it is in practice very large scale communalism, communal economy. Uh, there are very, very few rules. There is no government. All decisions are made by a consensus council. The consensus councils are loosely based on both the Shoni models, um, very loosely, I'd say, inspired more than based. And ultimately, you know, they do not yield any of your power to a representative. Each and every one of the 40,000 people there can participate in the council. Decisions are made by consensus. Or well, now, you know, uh, I think the uh, Occupy model of almost consensus has actually uh, been more and more efficient. The rainbows have, the rules are you cannot buy or sell anything. You cannot use hard drugs. <coughs> you cannot be violent. And you cannot claim to speak for rainbow. Everybody in the world is a rainbow. As a rainbow say, everybody with a belly button is a rainbow. But somebody showed up one day and opened the shirt and had no belly button. And so the rainbow amended that in council. Everybody with a belly button or without a belly button is a rainbow. Um, and which includes all the police who go there to shut down, to harass, you know, to otherwise disrupt the gathering. They're all rainbows too. They're just brothers and sisters that might need a little bit more love. So the rainbows use creative nonviolence to deal with potentially, you know, violent situations. I forgot when I said I was going to pace it, you got a camera. So, you know, bear with me. Um, the rainbows have a very strong commitment to, to nonviolence and have uh, been very effective in experimenting with various ways to um, confront violence with nonviolence. Unlike other utopian communities, memberships open to everybody. So they welcome violent, um, disruptive, addicted individuals. Because to be, according to rainbows, to be truly nonviolent, you have to not exclude violence. Because that's not really being nonviolent. That's like a, um, it's like a, a charter school that cherry picks the easy to educate students and then talks about what you know what a great success rate they have. So rainbows, you know, no hard drugs means no alcohol, um, but alcoholics are welcome. Alcohol is not, and that violent people come. There's been violent conflicts at rainbow gatherings since the beginning. And what makes rainbow nonviolent is that they confront this violence and nonviolence. Okay, so that's that's the quick, the skinny, the five minutes of who the rainbows are. And I've been asked to talk about the rainbow economy, the rainbow economic system, what kind of a model does it give us, and then also talk about ancient economies upon which the rainbow system is basically you know, modeled. And when I say ancient economies, we're going back to the hunter-gatherer gather economies. But I'd say um, to describe the rainbow economy, I'd call it communalism light. Uh, basically, uh, it's for the weekend communist. It's economic equality, but it's without the commitment. So unlike, unlike other utopian groups, you know, if you want to actually go and, and, and join whatever and think about the, you know, the big, big communes in the 1960s, if you want to join, it required total commitment. That's why they were called cults, because people in mainstream society could not imagine why anybody would want to give away all of their money and all of their other totems. So, but, uh, so to join the community, you used to have to like, you know, sign your car over to the collective motor pool, empty out your bank account, give all the money to the collective good, pure communism. The rainbows, no. You can park your BMW in a parking lot, try it out for two weeks. So that's why I call it weekend communism. And when you're there, yeah, you gotta wait in the same food lines as everybody else. If it's a rich gathering and the magic hat collects lots of money, everybody eats well. If it's a poor gathering and there's not that much food around, everybody's gonna be having a high carbohydrate diet. You know, a lot of rice, a lot of potatoes, maybe a little bit of roadkill to spice it up. It doesn't matter what you have hidden in the parking lot. People can put money into the magic hat. The magic hat's called the magic hat because for 40 some odd years it's now, um, you know, it's now going into 40, it's, it's 40 years, it's going 41 years. For 41 years, the magic hat has worked like magic. It has met all the expenses. It has allowed rainbows to plumb miles of piping through the forest, to tap springs, to move water over mountains. Uh, in 1972, they pioneered the first large-scale urban uh, recycling. They were, I remember when we went to the Rainbow Gathering in Vermont, 
The Rainbow Gathering was the second largest city in Vermont at the time it was there. And they've been able to pay all of their bills. Um, if people go to the hospitals and have no money, before the rainbows leave as part of the cleanup, they walk in and with cash from the Magic Hat pay all the hospital bills, settle all the scores. So the Magic Hat works. But it's really, it really is communalism light because you don't have to make a total commitment, but the more you get involved, the more you feel rewarded by the commitment. While at the gathering, participants can taste egalitarianism without that commitment. So it's kind of an experimental ground. The rainbow economy, however, is not sustainable on the ground. Rainbows do not go into the woods a few years early and start clearing the forest and planting corn, okay? Rainbows bring in resources from the outside. They bring in money for the magic hat. They take that money out to nearby communities and they buy wholesale food. They go out and they dumpster dive from the outside world. You know, they are bringing everything in. So the economy is not really sustainable <coughs> on the ground at the rainbow gathering. If it was not temporary, we would starve and probably go with all the social disruption that goes along with scarcity, or not, but it would be problematic. But it is, in fact, sustainable over the long term because the community stays cohesive despite its fusion-fission model. Now, let me explain this really quickly, fusion-fission. It means that after two or three weeks, the rainbow city disappears. It's gone. You're having a little bit of too much trouble with the state police? Don't worry about it. It's over. It's gone. You don't really have to fight that battle. You don't have to fight that war. Where do the rainbows go? They're gone. But then at some point in the future, in a different forest, in a different state, maybe in a different country, bang, it comes together again. This is an excellent strategy that's allowed it to su survive over four decades of persistent police brutality and disruptive techniques from the government because you disappear. Just like Occupy has. Rather than stay and fight every day to hold these parks, which really are not the focus, right? Occupy is now in a fissure state. Occupy is done fission. It's dissolved. It's gone. But it is still cohesive. It's still together. It comes together again in another place and then disappears, comes together again. That's the temporary autonomous zone model, the liberating time. So while the rainbows can't really stay on the ground, they can't really survive in the forest because they're not growing food, they are surviving in the fission state where they go out and start collecting resources in communities and they start spreading the ethos. Um, one of the things I've noticed uh, since the rainbow began in 1972 is fewer and fewer people actually go to the rainbow gatherings in the United States, but more and more of our cities look like rainbow gatherings. Here in Buffalo, the Elmwood Festival of the Arts borrows a large part of its template from rainbow gatherings. Everything from the active commitment to recycling <coughs> to the Elmwood Festival of the Arts version of Kitty Village, the kids parade, you know, the focus on everything being free for people to enjoy as far as music and so on. Uh, it just goes on and on. And that's because the people who organized it, many of them had experience with rainbow and then spread that ethos to a new generation, many of whom now have experience with the Elmwood Festival. So Rainbow, same thing, alternative medicine, you know, uh, alternatives to violence, and then again, this large-scale recycling, stuff that was radical, I mean, even, you know, even herbal medicine was radical in 1972. Stuff that was radical at Rainbow Gatherings, the Center for Alternative Living Medicine, the Rainbow Healing Facility, you know, uh, all of this stuff is now not mainstream, but we see it in cities all over the United States. So the community stays together and it stays vibrant even when it's dissolved, much like I like to think Occupy is doing. Um, true anarchy, true anarchism means participation is voluntary. So when people go to a rainbow, this is really important, this is how the rainbow economy works. Participation is voluntary. Who builds the infrastructure? Who cuts the trails? Who digs the shitters? That's, that's, you know, that's the most difficult.